All right, let's get back to Anselm. Um, I want to wrap this up. I want to see if we can get through the rest of On the Fall of the Devil today. Um, I recognize that it took us two full days to get through chapter 11, and there are 28, but hopefully. We'll see. Um, I did mention this... Uh, well, I mentioned this obliquely before, so I'll, I'll be a little more explicit now. Um, if you recall from when we were reading the Euthyphro, um, we noticed a sort of pattern of how they were discussing things. Where they would approach an issue and they would, they would examine it, they would try and come to a conclusion, but they would fall just short of it, and they would come back to that same issue again, now having the context and approaching it from a different way. Does anyone remember what this was called, this method, or this approach? We also saw it in Lewis's article on Manor Rabbit. This is what's referred to as the hermeneutic method. Uh, this began as, like I said, a method of, of um, Bible reading, of scriptural interpretation, but it can also be a writing technique as well, uh, where you will approach an issue, you'll examine it in a certain way, and then you'll reapproach the issue with the context of what you have in re-examining it. Chapter 12 is where we start the re-examination for, uh, for this dialogue. Reading this, you might have noticed that he's a bit repetitive here. He uses... Uh, he uses different examples to illustrate the same points at very different parts of the dialogue. Um, and that's because after this point, what they're doing is they are taking these the same questions, right? Questions of what is, uh, what was the devil's choice? Right? What was it that was, uh, what was it that the devil did to will to be like God? Uh, questions like, how is it that the devil made a choice against God? And then also, how is it that we make choices that are that are spontaneous in this way that if we go through this one time which is what we've basically done through chapter 11 we get some insights but there's more to see here as we've been alluding to you noticed last week how many times i said something like well we'll get to that well he needs to come back around to a bunch of these things uh, and to do that he winds up repeating himself kind of um so hopefully, part of what that will mean is that we can get through this relatively quickly because we can say, hey, remember when we talked about this? Cool, he's saying something similar. Here's what he's saying extra. All right, with that in mind, anything that we, uh, any questions or anything we want to address for, let's say, chapter 12? Anything in here? All right, so this is, again, um, more or less an, uh, a discussion, again, of what it means for something to be, uh, to be applied properly versus improperly. We discussed this a little bit last week and a little bit before that, uh, before break, when we were talking about uh, unfree choice. Uh, this is a philosophical distinction, again, between um, when we say that something is said properly, what does that mean, as opposed to improperly? Kind of, it's not as strong as that. So when we say something is said properly, it is correct, but also precise. It means exactly what it says and only what it says. When we say that something is said improperly, it's something like by metaphor or by analogy or uh, an alternative meaning of what's being said. So in this example, uh, when we say, uh, when he's talking about uh, what someone can do, we can say that in two different ways. We can say that in the sense of, uh, for example, I can wave my hand, right? But we also might say that I can, um, I can get a sunburn, maybe not today. I don't know, maybe, I'm pale, it's possible. But ordinarily, right, when we say that I can get a sunburn, we mean something very different from that, uh, from I can wave my hand. What's the difference? That I can wave my hand is sort of like, um, 
you're in control of it. It's a voluntary movement. Mm -hmm. And then you can't really... I mean, I guess you can control sunburn by putting sunscreen on, but the sun is in control in that sense. Right. One's active and one's passive in this case. And this isn't necessarily a distinction that, that Ansel makes, right, between active and passive. Um, at least not in so many words. But that's basically what he's getting at here in terms of our capacities, our capabilities. Because there are certain things that are, uh, to, to sort of to call back to our discussion of Aquinas a while ago, um, there's a difference between potentials, things that can happen to us or changes that we can undergo or things that something else can affect us, right? Ways that something else can affect us. Mere potential, right? Versus what we would call powers. Things that we can do. I can wave my hand in a very different sense than I can get a sunburn. Because when I say I can get a sunburn, how might you rephrase that? More properly. Mm -hmm. It could be a sunburn. Why the difference? I think because you're right. Because getting a sunburn is more of a possibility and it's more mm -hmm. up to chance than you making the like, active choice to, to wave your hand. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's actually a rephrasing I hadn't thought of. That wasn't the one I had in mind, but that's a great example. Right? Um, saying that you could, uh, saying I could get a sunburn, it, it speaks to the sort of chance of it. It's not something I directly control. Maybe it's something that I might control the circumstances around, right? I can decide whether to go outside or not. I can decide whether to apply sunscreen. I can apply whether uh, I can decide what to wear, whether to stand in the shade, whatever. But it's something that may or may not happen to me. It's not something that, like, I can wave my hand. Is something I can just simply decide to do or not. So I think that's right. I think that's a good a good way of looking at the distinction. What else? Because I had something different in mind that kind of speaks to the same thing. How, might, how else might you rephrase, I can get a sunburn? Maybe, but I would say that that's even more improper in Anselm's terms. To say that you have the ability to do something really speaks to what you can accomplish, right? rather than what can happen to you. So I can get a sunburn, or I can get sunburned. There we go. The sun can burn me is what I was thinking of. Right. Now this one, I think the interesting part about this, this alternative is the change of subject. Because when we talk about, I can get a sunburn, saying this improperly, right? Not saying that I have some power to become sunburned. Right? What we're saying is instead that something outside of me, the sun, has the capacity to burn my skin. That's what we're saying. We're not saying that I have some innate capacity, right? Something that I'm capable of doing, some kind of power to... to attract the sun's rays such that it darkens my skin or something like that. No, not what we're going for, right? Not what we're saying. What we're saying is that, to your point, this is something that could happen to me, depending on outside factors, mostly. This is something that, that could happen or could not happen, and that's not directly under my control, because it's not something I directly and spontaneously do, like waving my hand around. In addition, we would say, to, to sort of elaborate on this, that this is caused by something else. If we want to be precise with our language, the subject of the sentence should not be I, it should be the sun. Because the sun is the active, uh, the active participant in the exchange, right? If we're talking about me getting sunburned, that, well, not, not quite grammatically, but philosophically, we would say that's, that's something like the passive voice. So why is this relevant? Well, we can talk about things like, well, first of all, things that uh, God is capable of.
So this is, first of all, to eliminate the concern of can God sin? Right? Because we want to say that God is incapable of sinning, right? at least in some sense. But he wants to elaborate and try, and try and outline that this does not mean that there is some power or capacity that God doesn't have. So with this distinction in mind between, between this, the, the, the sort of active versus passive or the, the proper and improper, how might we try and rephrase God is incapable of sin or God cannot sin? You're weirdly close. It sounds bizarre. Anybody else want to give it a try? How close? So we don't want to... So I think the only... There's two ways of approaching it. The way you're approaching it, which I think is, is one perfectly correct way, I think, is... Maybe still, it'll still wind up being slightly improper. So when you said something like sin is incapable of, uh, of what, overcoming God or something like that? Or yeah. swaying God or something like that? Changing God, maybe. Uh, tempting, even. Remember our discussion in, on freedom of choice? When we were talking about what are the capabilities of sin and can we be overcome by sin, right? Can the will be overcome by temptation? Stuff like that. And we said no, but we also kind of said yes, right? If you remember the arm wrestling example and stuff like that, right? If the will can be overcome, that can mean two things. It can either mean that temptation is capable of overcoming the will, or it can mean the will is capable of just not trying sufficiently. Which isn't to say that it's capable of something, it means that it is in one sense, imperfect. If the will is capable of being overcome by, by temptation, what that means is the, the will is, in this circumstance, not being exercised to its fullest capacity. So to say that God is incapable of sin, part of what we mean there, to follow your phrasing of this, is that, is that sin or temptation is incapable of overcoming the will of God. There's no temptation for God to give into, in other words. Something like that. But we can take this farther, and we can say something like, God, if we say that God is incapable of sin, what that means is, if we were to speak more, more properly, more correctly, more precisely, would be something more like, God is capable of, let's just use, the, I mean, understanding that these are analogous terms somewhat, God is capable of maintaining or, uh, or holding on to rectitude. God is capable of doing the right thing all of the time. God is capable of, of well, obviously more than this, but in, in the moral sense, creating and directing good things solely, and not being responsible for evil, because that's what we would mean in the context of God sinning, would be God, the creator, being somehow causally responsible for evil in the world, which we don't want to have. That would be a contradiction with the very idea of God. So to say that God cannot sin in this case is rather to say that God is not just incapable of being overcome by sin, in other words, sin is incapable of overcoming God, but more so, God is perfect, but morally speaking. It speaks rather than, rather than it being about something that God is incapable of doing, it's talking about something that God is capable of doing, maintaining justice constancy in justice. And so it, what seems like a, an inability can be rephrased or reframed 
into an ability or a power, a capacity. Anselm is ultimately going to want to say that the same applies to the good angels, those angels who chose not to turn away from God, the, the angels that didn't fall. That they will wind up with this very same capacity, this very same inability to sin, which what we really mean by that is uh, the power to preserve rectitude of the will for its own sake indefinitely. And not to be turned away from, right? again, passive, be turned away from, uh, from justice by temptation, by will for advantage, by whatever else might come. All right. Questions on that, that distinction in particular? Anything there? All right. Okay, so these next few, um, these next few chapters, thirteen through fifteen, eh, fourteen really, um, are an extended thought experiment about God, about how God may have created the angels, and God creating the angels part by part rather than all at once, and looking at how that would work and how that would look like. The takeaway from this section is looking at um, what if you only had one inclination? Right? We talked about the different wills that we might have, at least the two of justice and advantage last time. Right? And here in this section, he's speculating, okay, what if you only had the will for advantage? What if you only desired those things which are beneficial for you? Or, by contrast, what if you only desired justice? What if you only desired... Uh, the good of uh, of all, including at the expense of oneself. In both of those cases, he ultimately concludes that the will could not be just. Why not? So if we only had one inclination towards either advantage or towards justice, but not the other, we couldn't be properly called just. Why not? Oh. Want to give it a try? Because you're not making like, the choice to be just. It's already like given, and it's not really just if it, it's not really justice if it's not like a power to like choice. Yeah, so remember, we defined justice as rectitude of the will preserved for its own sake. It preserved because it is justice. I don't want to get into the, uh, well, we have this notion in, in more modern discussions, philosophers, I mean, uh, have this notion in more modern discussions of free will, um, of alternative possibilities um, being necessary for genuine free choices. Anselm isn't really saying that here. What he's saying is that if there were only the will for advantage and there were no inclination towards justice whatsoever, that, well, obviously we wouldn't be just, we also wouldn't be unjust. Because there's nothing about our nature which is inclined towards justice. We wouldn't say, for example, that a squirrel is evil because it steals your muffin. They do that, but we don't morally condemn them for it because they only have a will for advantage. They only seek what will benefit them. Right? There isn't, well, we say that there is no capacity for free choice. Um, either of these will work if there's seats around. Also, there's one over there if we want to drag it over. Um, so, a squirrel, which only has a will for advantage, doesn't, we wouldn't say has, has free will in the genuine full sense that human beings do, or angels for that matter, um, because they don't have an inclination for justice. 
Now, if we want to parse that in psychological terms, it would be something like they, do, they aren't capable of the kind of rational abstraction required to understand the greater good or something like that, right? Um, the good of the whole as opposed to the good of the, of the one or the self. So if we only had the will for advantage, we wouldn't be unjust because justice wouldn't be missing. It just wouldn't be there. So again, like uh, to go back to our, our what is nothing and what is sin and what is evil example from last time, you wouldn't say that there are shadows right now because the sun isn't out. It's not like there's a shadow here. Even though if the sun were to come out, the, the amount of light here would be roughly the same or maybe even more right? if the sun came out from the clouds. We only speak of sin or injustice if something should be there but is missing. And in a case where we only have an inclination for advantage, there's nothing missing there. And so we don't have this, uh, we don't have justice or injustice. Okay, by contrast, if we only have a will for justice, if it's the only thing that we will, and there is no will for our own advantage, we have no self-interest, in other words, we are also, we wouldn't be called just because it's not preserved for its own sake. It's not preserved because it is just. To make that choice genuine, it needs to be contrasted with some other possibility. Now, again, not necessarily, you know, choosing between A and B, but there needs to be a contrast between willing something because it's just, because it's just, versus willing something because it's advantageous. Now, why I make this <laughs> distinction, bless you, and why I am... Um, taking so much time to emphasize that this isn't about necessarily alternative possibilities, choosing between A and B, but rather more like choosing A because it's just versus choosing A because it's advantageous, is because you can have the same thing, the same choice, the same result, be chosen for both different reasons, assuming that we, we being humans or angels or whatever, have both inclinations. You might say, help someone because you want something back from them, or you might help someone because you want them to be better off. And which one you're doing will look identical. But they'll be radically different from a moral perspective. One will be neutral at best. If you're helping someone because you expect them to benefit you later on, maybe that's not, maybe that's not unjust. Right? I mean, because otherwise we would have to say that like paid lifeguards are unjust. That, that seems off. It's not unjust, but it's not morally it's not morally laudable. It's not morally praiseworthy in the same way that helping someone because it's the right thing to do, because they need help, would be. Like out of charity, out of out of concern for someone else, that sort of thing. That's why we make that distinction. Right? It can be the same action that we're choosing between. Okay. Cool? Clear enough? That part? Simple, but now, um, as I mentioned, he goes through you know four pages or five pages, and two chapters to say that. So uh, this is why we're hopefully getting through a little more quickly. Um, and this also brings us into chapter sixteen, where he brings up that justice is not sorry injustice. Chapter title: Injustice is nothing other than the absence of justice where there ought to be. So it's, again, it's not like we can call a, a squirrel unjust because it steals something from you. Because it doesn't actually steal something from you. It takes something which is yours, but it can have no notion of its versus your property and so it is not doing something which is contrary to justice. It's just doing something that's unrelated to justice. So, um, so he continues on, right? I'm going to quote a couple of a couple of little pieces in here. So he says, um, "The more honorable it is to have justice, the more dishonorable it it is to lack justice." Indeed, the only reason that the will is dishonored by not having justice through its own fault, that's important, 
is that it is honored by being obligated to have justice by the goodness of its giver. So what this means is that if that the will, he's talking specifically about the will of the angels, but we can apply this to human beings as well, has a natural inclination towards justice. Justice is something that we ought to and uh, that we ought to strive for and that we have a, a kind of natural inclination towards. And we also have other inclinations. He's talking about the will for advantage, right? Things that are for our own sake, for our own benefit. And so if we choose other wills, whether that's advantage or whatever else, we talked about some other possibilities, over and against justice, that is wrong in a way that it wouldn't necessarily be wrong for, um, you know, for a, for a squirrel or something to choose something for its own advantage, even if it's at the expense of someone else. And it's because we have naturally an inclination towards justice. So part of what we are as free creatures, as, uh, as creatures capable of free choice, is we are by nature just. We are by nature inclined, not just towards our own advantage, but towards one another. We're social creatures. We're, we're political animals, uh, to use the Aristotelian term. Part of what it is to be a human being is concern for not only one's own well-being, but for the well-being of others, for their own sake, not simply for the sake of what I can gain. And so if we neglect that, or if we abandon that, what we're doing is we are acting as less than what we are, which is worse than being less than what we are. Because we should be more. Right? It's falling short of your potential, in other words. We think of it as, to use maybe a mundane example, we think of it as more of a tragedy for, say, a star athlete to break their leg than for me, a mild-mannered academic who likes to sit all the time to break my leg, right? Both are the same injury. Neither is pleasant. Both are gravely injurious, and I might even have longer long-term consequences because I'm not in as good shape as a star athlete, right? So my recovery would be more difficult, more arduous, more painful, take longer, all that. So it might be subjectively worse for me, but we would look at it as a greater tragedy for someone who, who has to miss a full season, say, or worse, it ends their career because they're, well, they are more capable of using that leg than I am, especially for, for greater things. My legs get me here, and then I take my weight off of them. Then my legs get me back home, and then I take my weight off of them. And sometimes I go for a run, but that's recreation. Right? It's, not like, it's not like I do things fundamental to my identity or fundamental to my life or fundamental to, or even really extremely beneficial to others with, with my athleticism, such as it is, right? So this is where we get the principle of the corruption of the greatest is the least. So it is a greater tragedy for something greater to be corrupted than something lesser to be corrupted, even if it's not objectively speaking, as bad. So another example he uses, right? Um, he says, for example, um, not having a beard is not dishonorable for a man who is not yet supposed to have a beard, but once he ought to have a beard is unbecoming for him not to have one. In other words, it would be silly for you to make fun of a four-year-old for not being able to grow a beard. But we all know that it's a common, I presumably we all know, that it's a common thing for men, like grown men, to make fun of each other for, for having patchy beards and such, right? It makes sense to make fun of someone for that if you're a grown adult man, not if you're four. Because if you're four, why would there be any reasonable expectation for you to grow a beard or be able to? Right? So that's what he's getting at, right? What he's getting at is that if something is appropriate to a thing or is part of something's nature, then, have, then missing that thing, not having whatever that is, 
that's when that becomes a significant problem, where it's not just uh, that it doesn't have it, but it's missing that, whatever that is, in this case, justice, or a beard, or a leg functioning, whatever. All right. Anything else? Any questions on this stuff before we move on? All right. So the next few chapters are, again, reiterating more of what we've gone over. Because like I said, he's going back through in circles here. You look frustrated. <laughs> Was this something you noticed? Or? No, I just, yeah. um, Okay, because um, like, like I said, this is something that we've encountered now. This is the third text that we've read that does this whole, this whole hermeneutic thing. So if you don't like this, I apologize. This class is heavy with it. Um, but I, I hope at least this is helping to, uh, to lend more insight each time we go through. Um, so chapter 17 through 19, maybe even 20. Eh, more 19, really. Um, is again, going back into how it is that the choice that the angels make is permanent. So this is kind of calling back, uh, harkening back to chapter six. Yeah, six. This is about that initial choice that God gives to the angels, right? The, the great trick that God played on Satan, between the choice between, uh, between choosing to, uh, to keep and be thankful for and maintain what one has, or to reach for something extra that God did not will the angels to have yet. And the devil chose to forsake what he had in favor of gaining this extra thing, so he lost what he had, he was incapable of gaining the additional thing, he lost everything, and chapter 17 here, we find, we figure out in a little more detail why it is that this is so permanent. Because he cannot return, Anselm says, he can't return to justice. In other words, he can't repent. Because repentance could only possibly be for the sake of advantage. Because he has nothing that he, that he isn't... There's nothing that he could want that he isn't already missing. That he isn't lacking. So anything that he could gain would be for advantage. There's nothing that he has that he could forsake for the sake of for the sake of justice. And so the only thing left to will is advantage, even though there are some things which he could will that would be just. It could only be for the sake of advantage, because that's the only uh, the only the only possibility of willing that he has left. And then 18, again, part of this, this is where we get that weird who gets credit for what part. I've said before, I've, I've mentioned this over and over, uh, even going back to the previous dialogues, um, how ultimately what we're aiming for and what we wind up getting right here is how God is in no way responsible for sin or evil, but that is wholly the doing of the sinners, so the devil, right? And other sinners, other fallen angels, other fallen human beings, whatever. But sin, evil, is, whole, is wholly the fault of creatures. It is not the fault of the creator in any way. However, good things, good actions, are entirely imputed or attributed to God, and also entirely attributed or imputed to creatures. Both. Entirely. It's not 50-50, it's 100-100. And this is where we get that. So, first of all, so it's not so he first lays out that it would have been impossible for the angels, any of the angels, the fallen or unfallen angels, to give themselves justice. In other words, to do the right thing apart from what God gave them. 
If God hadn't given them an inclination towards justice and the capacity to will it and all of that, they couldn't have done so on their own. Obviously, they were created. They're contingent. They're reliant on God. So they couldn't have done it without God. So God is responsible for their capacity for justice. However, as demonstrated by the difference between the fallen and unfallen angels, the good angels, those who chose justice, are also responsible for that choice. They're morally and causally responsible for that choice. They couldn't have done it without God. God is entirely responsible for their capacity for doing so. And they are also entirely responsible for making that choice. However, on the other hand, Satan and the fallen angels receive everything they have from God. And because there was this alternative possibility, they are responsible for abandoning it. So they are responsible, the angels, are responsible for not having all of the things that God tried to give to them. And God is responsible for them having everything that they have and the capacity for, uh, and the, the chance they missed out on, let's say. So what we have, again, is a sort of incongruity here. We have God being responsible for all good things. Creatures being responsible for all of their good things. Both working together but creatures also being responsible for all of their bad things without God being causally or morally responsible for them. That is the distinction. And that's how that winds up working. All right. So the next couple of chapters are, again, relating back to something we've already discussed kind of at the end of last time when we were talking about what is evil. And now he begins to ask, what is an evil will or an evil choice? Right? Yeah, it's, it's a choice that is not inclined towards what it ought to be. It's a choice that is deficient in some way. It's missing something, missing justice. So it can either, that can either mean that the will, as in the, the capacity for willing, that the first part, is missing an inclination towards justice. It's not inclined towards justice. Or the actual choice being made, the actual outcome, is towards something which is contrary to justice. It's, it is a choice for nothing, in other words. So it's not nothing, exactly. It's still something. And he's very careful to lay out that insofar as it is something, it is good. It's still the capacity for choice. It is still an inclination towards something. It's even still an inclination towards something good, because advantage is not a bad thing. I don't know if I, did I emphasize this enough? Hopefully, but the will for advantage that God gives the angels is not bad, not on its own. Right? And this is why the good angels still maintain their will for advantage. They still will to, uh, to benefit themselves. It's just that that is uh, when aligned with what is just. Like we will things for advantage all the time that are independent of justice, right? I willed to make myself coffee this morning, and that was in no way related to justice one way or another, and it was a good thing, right? Because it's beneficial for me, and that's good. But here, the evil will, or the evil choice, we can't say that it is nothing, because the will isn't nothing. The choice isn't nothing. But it is a choice for nothing is a choice that, which is disinclined from being. It is, it is directed away from goodness, from being, from justice. And so this is how he gets away with saying that God made evil wills and evil choices, but he didn't make them evil. Does that make sense? Explain, what do I mean there? This is in chapter 20, if you're looking. I don't remember 
remember what it says in the text, but I can just... Go for it, yeah. Oh. Like, God created the existence of these things, but we created them by the Something like that. Elaborate more? You're on the right track. Sort of, um, like, we didn't, these things were not created until they were actually. I don't know, maybe I'm not, maybe I can say, like, God knows, like, God knows the future, He knows everything that's going on. Like, yeah. Kind of. We have to get there, because that's the next chapter is when he says that's not quite the case, but it seems like that's the case. So it's kind of a case, but it's kind of not. And time is really complicated, so wait a minute. We'll get there. Um, but sorry, go on. I, 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 I I'm not really sure. Honestly, I was just, I'm just saying that we create them by doing that. Yeah. Yeah, you're on the right track, right? So God creates the will. And God creates the choice. Right? The thing that we are choosing we are only capable of choosing it because, bless you, um, because as we've outlined, you need several things in order to choose something. You need the inclination, you need the will itself, the capacity for choice, you need the thing you're choosing, and you need something to not get in the way, right? So God is responsible for all of those things. We are responsible for not doing that. Because if we don't exercise it, we just don't. And what that means is if we don't choose the right thing, we are responsible for choosing the wrong thing, for turning ourselves away from what we should be choosing. God is there uh, causally and even morally responsible for our capacity for choice, the choice we can choose, all of that. But we are the ones responsible for turning it away. So God is responsible for the evil will. In other words, the will that makes the wrong choice but we are responsible for the wrong choice because it's our choice, because it's our will, because it is spontaneous. In other words, it is not caused by anything outside of the self. Good so far? Time to, time to get into the whole time thing? Do we want to go for that? Because it's complicated. Okay. I've mentioned, I think I've mentioned, philosophy of time gives me a headache in general, so it's, it's wildly complicated. I don't know if anyone can make sense of it. Probably someone. Not necessarily me. I can try. Um, I have, uh, if you are interested in this topic and the issue of, of time and, and philosophy of time and what does it mean for, for things to be in or out of time and how does time relate to causality and stuff like that, um, I, did a, I did a lecture about, this was a little while ago, about... Um, you didn't see uh, Marvel's Loki, the series? Oh, I did. Great. I hated it. I'm sorry. I hated it for professional reasons, though, um, because it does, it does a very bad job of portraying um, time and timelines and how causality works there within and all of that. I, I, I try my damnedest to explain why in, a, I think it's like a 50-minute lecture or something. So there's that. I'll probably put it in supplemental material if I remember, uh, if you're interested and want to take a look or notes or whatever. Um, this, thankfully, uh, is more complicated, but probably makes more sense. Okay, so, first of all, the question here is about foreknowledge. Foreknowledge here in the sense of reliable and necessary, or even necessarily correct prediction. Right. To say that you have foreknowledge of something is to say that you know the truth value of a future proposition. In other words, if I were to say that I know what I will have for lunch today, is to say that I know what I will have for lunch in the same sense that I know what I'm looking at right now. Right? Or I know what's in my cup. Right? Things that I know with ordinary kind of, uh, ordinary kind of certainty this becomes a problem for temporal creatures in general, you know, us, because we experience temporal progression and that means that things can change and sometimes unpredictable things can change or things can change unpredictably. So prediction for knowledge, 
for finite creatures such as ourselves is difficult if not impossible. Um, Aristotle thought it was impossible, for example. Aristotle thought that, that future propositions have no truth value until they occur. So if I were to say, for example, uh, Aristotle's example is there will be a sea battle tomorrow. There will be a battle at sea somewhere tomorrow. Okay, is that true or is that false? Yeah. Right. Epistemologically, we don't know. Right. That much is probably pretty clear. Stands to reason there's probably a truth value to that statement. Aristotle disagreed. Aristotle said that there is no truth value to that statement until it either happens or doesn't happen. Because the truth maker, in other words, what makes it true or false, just hasn't occurred yet. Now, there are other views of this. Right? That, the, that the, the causality of the, the event in the future can sort of reach into the past in the same way that, uh, the, the, that final causality can. For example, um, if I go get lunch today, when I'm on my way there, we can ask, why am I going there? What is causing me to go wherever it is that I go for lunch? Right. Well, it's the food that is there that does not exist yet. So something that doesn't exist yet is causing my actions now. So it, it could be similar to that, right? Something like that. Hello, Professor McCoy here from the editing room. I'm realizing that I might need to explain this concept a bit more in detail. This is a little bit complicated, so I should take a little bit of time, uh, or what time I need, to explain this a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, uh, more fully, more completely. So, what I'm talking about here is causality that doesn't flow in the ordinary direction that we would expect, uh, given time passing from past to present into the future. This is rather uh, a sequence of causality where future events cause things in the present and in the past in their uh, their, their perspective past. This is what we might call counter-temporal causality, or causality that goes against the ordinary flow of time. This might seem very strange, but this is in fact very ordinary, uh, at least in accordance with our ordinary experiences. We experience this sort of thing all the time, whether it's the, whether it's the going to lunch example or whatever else. If you make a plan to do something in the future, then the goal of that plan is causing you to do what you need to do to prepare for it. So the events in the future are actually causing the events and the actions in the present. This is what any kind of final causality is, as I mentioned. And so here we can see uh, the example I gave of getting something to use for something in the future. If I were to ask you for example, uh, to with the uh, what am I going to have for lunch example, if I were to ask you, why did you buy that sandwich? And you were to respond with efficient causes. You bought the sandwich because you felt hungry, or you bought the sandwich because uh, you had money in your pocket, which is what allowed you to be able to buy it, or something like that. You would think that was a very strange answer. Rather, the ordinary kind of answer to why did you buy that sandwich is so I can have it for lunch, or something along those lines. The entire point of most of our actions that are directed towards ends, which are anything that we can properly call an action, is for the purpose of an end goal, which is in the future. And so those end goals that exist in the future are causing our actions right now. So if I'm having a sandwich for lunch today, that means that I say yesterday, bought it. I put it in my shopping cart and I purchased the thing and then I put it in my refrigerator last night and then this morning I put it in my bag to take with me all because I'm planning on eating it for lunch today. So my lunch today is causing all of these events to have happened in the past. So we can see that this, is, this seems sort of intuitively strange to say that causality goes, that future events can cause events in the present or in the past. But this aligns perfectly well with our ordinary experience of how we do things, why we do things, how we make choices, how we make, how we do actions.
People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. All right, let's get back to it. For knowledge can also be something like knowledge of the necessary outcomes of what we know will occur or what we know uh, will be the consequences of what we do or the consequences of what we know will happen or something like that. That's another way that foreknowledge is, is possible for temporal beings, things that experience temporal progression. Or experience you know, linear causality or call it what you want. That is something like, yes, I can foreknow the outcome of what will happen if I turn my coffee cup upside down. Right? I can know with certainty that if I turn this upside down, coffee will spill out onto the ground, right, if I do that. There's a cup down there. Interesting. I didn't know that. I'll clean that up afterwards. Anyway. But I can foreknow that because I know the I know the intricacies of the causalities involved. I know how gravity works. I know that there was coffee in here, it still is. I know that, you know, if I tip it over, that the top of it's open, the bottom of it's closed. I know all these all of these things, and so I can reliably and uh, I can reliably predict the outcome. I can know what the outcome will be. Okay. couple of things that he goes into here. First of all, it has to be necessarily the case that, that Satan did not foreknow the consequences of this initial choice between justice and advantage. Because if he, well, let's think of it this way. What was he seeking to choose? What was he pursuing? To be like God, to have everything that he could possibly have. Advantage, right? Choosing his own will over that of God. Okay? If he was seeking advantage, if he was seeking to have everything he could possibly have, and he knew the outcome of this choice would be to have nothing, how could he have possibly chosen it? He couldn't have, right? Similarly, the good angels, if they were willing for justice, in other words, they were willing to forsake this additional something, this additional beneficial something that they could have had. If they were willing to forsake that, they could not have done so if they knew, if they had foreknowledge, that God was going to give it to them afterwards as a reward. They could not have willed to reject it if they knew they were going to get it anyway. So in both cases... It relies on a certain, um, on a lack of absolute foreknowledge in order to make the choice. Now this isn't a problem because the choice is what's morally relevant, right? The, the, what is being chosen in that particular moment, in that particular circumstance. Right? That's what's morally relevant, and the, the only way that it can be made morally relevant is by obscuring the possibility of foreknowledge. That they can't know what the outcomes will ultimately be. The outcomes have to be unexpected. They are the natural consequences in both cases. They're the natural, natural consequences of the choice, but in order for the choice to exist as a choice, as, especially as a morally significant choice, those outcomes can't be known in advance. One, my favorite analogy for this, for, th for this whole setup of choice, is something like a cosmic marshmallow test. Do you know what I'm talking about? What is the marshmallow test? It's, um, well, it was like a research project, and, mm -hmm. you know, they put, um, like, toddlers in a room, and they put marshmallows in front of them, and they said, we're going to be back in 15 minutes, and you're, do not eat the marshmallow. When you get back, you can eat the marshmallow. Mm -hmm. And so it was to test to see if the children would eat the marshmallow as soon as the researcher left the room, or if they would be patient and wait for them to get back. Mm -hmm. I think if they got like two marshmallows or something like that, if they didn't eat it. There's a bunch of different versions of it, yeah. yeah. So it's to test something like delayed gratification, right? The ability to, to, to put one's, uh, one's future advantage over one's current advantage. We can also think of this in terms of um, our ability to follow instructions, right? It's another thing that this can test. Right. Or it could be used to test something like, um, here's an example, 
if you, let's, let's edit the marshmallow test to make it more analogous to Satan's choice. Let's say toddlers in a room, there's a marshmallow in front of them, they can eat it, or if they wait for however long, um, they can uh, have both them and their friend can each get two if they wait 15 minutes. Okay, so they gain advantage and they gain uh, and they gain advantage for someone they care about, right? Something something outside of oneself, a kind of uh, uh, empathetic reward, if you want if you want to put it that way. This isn't a perfect analogy, but let's just go with it. So something like that, the good angel, the good toddler, waits. Uh, waits for the 15 minutes or the 10 minutes or, because 10 minutes is a very long time for, you know, a three or four year old. So I know, trust me. Um, I have a three or four year old. Um, she's not good at this, I'm, 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 I'm sad to say. Um, she needs practice. Anyway, if they wait, then not only do they wind up benefiting, but somebody else does too. It is for the sake of not just oneself, but for the sake of something beyond oneself. Okay, cool. By contrast, the child who reaches out and grabs the marshmallow, like as soon as the, the supervisor experimenter leaves uh, and goes into the other room to watch, that's Satan. That's Satan toddler. Satan toddler, upon finding that taking this marshmallow and, and trying to eat it, finds out that it is not a marshmallow, it is, uh, it is a ball of wax. And after taking a massive bite out of this ball of wax, or whatever, something that's not appetizing, finds out that they have lost the initial treat, as well as the future treat, as well as the future treat for others, through their bad choice. They're not doing, not doing the thing that was going to be caring for others, and therefore suffering a consequence for themselves as well. Now, if the kid knew that the marshmallow in front of them was not a marshmallow, it was not really a marshmallow, it was not actually something that they could achieve and delight in and all of that, it would not have been nearly as tempting. I say not nearly as tempting because, you know, toddlers might eat wax, that happens. But um, crayons are wax. You know how kids are. Um, but in general, they will be far less tempting. But if they think that it's something delicious that they could have right now, even at the expense of having more later, and at the expense of others getting something, that can be quite tempting. All right, so the other issue here, so we get, we get the, the, the foreknowledge of, of the angels here. The other issue here is divine foreknowledge. Now this is a huge problem in philosophy and in theology, um, where the problem goes something like this. God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, right? Presumably. If God knows everything, and there is a truth of the matter as to what I will do tomorrow, God knows. Okay? Can I choose to do something different? Well, we're, we're already stipulating that suppose um, God knows that I'm going to be, that tomorrow, because um, I don't have class tomorrow, I will wake up at approximately 10 a.m. It's reasonable. Let's assume that that is the case. If God knows that, can I possibly wake up earlier or later? I feel like that's a trick question. It is, yes. But why? Why it's a trick is the fascinating part because because it, you think about it in a, a lot of people will, way, uh -huh. it's like oh it doesn't matter what happens God already has your plan made for you so your day is already like you just don't know it but whatever happens through the day was meant to happen because God already wrote it. Yeah, but here's the problem. That means I don't have free choice. Exactly. That's where I'm like, well, I mean, I guess because like if you say you're gonna wake up at ten a.m. 
but then suddenly you wake up at 8 a.m. because your body naturally wakes up at that hour mm -hmm. instead of 10, that's kind of like... Maybe a better example is something that I have voluntary choice over, like what I choose to have for breakfast when I wake up at 10 a.m. Okay. Right? Yeah. Just because God knows that you're going to do something doesn't necessarily mean that like he's willing you to do it. There we go. That's a big part of it. All right, let me give you an example. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Those of you who had, you had a sandwich for breakfast. Great, great example, that'll work. Okay, no problem. You knew, you now, you know that you had a sandwich for breakfast this morning. You're fairly certain of that. Could you have had something else? Nothing usually, yeah. Okay, but yeah, right, you didn't have to. You didn't, yeah. There was nothing necessitating you having a sandwich this morning, but you know with certainty that you had a sandwich this morning, right? Are those two things contradictory? You can't be wrong. You, you know with absolute certainty you had a sandwich for breakfast this morning. However, it is entirely possible for you to have not had a sandwich this morning for breakfast. Are those contradictory? They seem like it. When I say it that way, it seems like it. You see why? How are they not contradictory? The two things can exist at the same time. Like, two truths can exist at the same time. Not if they're contradictory, though. So we have to figure out how they can fit together, how they work together. Why not? You're right, they're not. Why not? One or the other, it's more by chance than by choice. Like, I had like protein packs this morning, uh -huh. but I was thinking about getting a cheese danish instead. Either choice isn't really like of moral significance or even just significance oh, right. of the choice yeah. itself. But it is a genuine choice, right? It was because you chose. And you could have gone the other way, right? There's nothing, there's nothing contradictory about going the other way with it, right? However, you now know what you chose. So your knowledge in one sense, dictates what you had, but it didn't cause it. You know what you had for breakfast because you chose to have it for breakfast. You didn't choose to have it for breakfast because you now know you had it for breakfast. The causality goes the other direction. The same applies with God's knowledge. Because as he says, and some points out, he says, for the time being, I will reply briefly, God's foreknowledge is not properly called foreknowledge. To him, everything is always present. So he does not have foreknowledge of what is future, but simply knowledge of what is present. So since the argument regarding foreknowledge of a future thing differs from that regarding knowledge of a present thing, divine foreknowledge need not have the same implications as the foreknowledge we're asking about now. So divine foreknowledge is not knowledge of what will happen. It is knowledge of what happens. And it is in, and it's caused by what happens. So, God knows what you will choose tomorrow because that's what you will choose. You're the one who will choose it tomorrow. Why this is in the time section is because of God's relationship to time. God, if we're to understand God properly in terms of uh, understanding how God could know future propositions in this way, God cannot be in time. In other words, God cannot experience temporal sequence in the way that we do, right? this moment happening and then that moment happening. God observes creation like an author observes a text. Think of it this way as well. Think of it like you're writing a story and you know what the character will choose in a later chapter. Yes, in a sense, you're causally responsible for what they choose, but also the events in the story and the character are responsible for what that choice is. In other words, you as the author could perfectly well write a character incorrectly in a way that doesn't make sense. In other words, what that means is that you would be artificially changing something about the character from outside. God doesn't ordinarily do that, like shy of a miracle, right? That's what a miracle means. Hence the deus ex machina kind of thing for, for, for the fictional uh, application of this kind of, this kind of problem. Right? 
So the causal regularities are consistent within the world, even if God is ultimately causal, re causally responsible for the world as a whole. It's just that internally, we still have a reasonable and, uh, and point A to point B causal sequence that makes sense internally. And that, that is the actual cause of God's knowing what will occur. It's not that God knows what will occur, and therefore it happens. It happens. It will happen. And therefore God knows that it will occur. Causality goes in the other direction. Question? Or just movement? Okay. I assume movement is inquisitive. That's it. That's a teacher thing. I apologize. All right. Any, t any other time questions? How can we move on? What do you think? Yeah, maybe? Speaking of, what time is it? Okay, we got we got a few minutes. Maybe. No. Kind of stupid. Go like, for have it. Have you seen the good place? Some of it. Have, do you know the Jeremy Barony like thing, like the time in the afterlife? Yeah. Like Jeremy Barony. Yeah. In cursive, like kind of, and it's just like by chance, but that's how it works, and so everything is kind of like overlapping, or it's separate, and you know, the right. eye is like sometimes Thursdays. I don't remember the specifics, but I know what you're talking about. And yeah, it's that it's that it, it's where we encounter the problem of of what the hell can it possibly be like to be outside of time, and we as temporal creatures have trouble have trouble understanding this. Right. Um, this is, I think, something that the Good Place and a few other things handle a lot better than, say, Loki, the thing that I was wildly criticizing for this purpose, for this reason, almost exclusively. Um, there's some characterization stuff that I don't, I don't really love, but Loki's development was way rushed, that kind of thing. Um, but that aside, that's not my expertise. My expertise is philosophy, metaphysics stuff. To use this example, there is a sequence of events in the TVA, the, the Time Variance Authority place, the office, which is supposed to be outside of the flow of time. Huh? That has to mean that it is its own timeline, so to speak, but it's outside of time, so it's its own set of, sort of timeline sitting above the sacred timeline and all the other branches and variances and stuff. It doesn't quite make sense. And I go in, again, in that lecture, I go into some, into some possibilities, into how it can make sense, and I wind up kind of, like, maybe a spoiler, I kind of wind, up, wind up settling on the Austin Powers explanation of stop worrying it and just have a good time. <laughs> Because that's really the only explanation that can make sense. Um, anyway, 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 that's neither here nor there. Um, suffice it to say, it's it's very difficult for us to, us temporal creatures to understand time from a sort of God's eye view. Incredibly difficult, uh, which is why philosophy of time tends to make my head hurt. Um, okay, so I, I kind of went through a lot. There's a little bit left that I really want to focus on, and it is in the second to last chapter in 27. This is the part we haven't really covered before, and I want to, I want to just sort of read uh, some from the very end of chapter 27. Uh, this dialogue between the student and teacher. Um, so, the student is asking once again, because again, we've, we've already covered this, yes, but we're covering it in a little more detail. He says, why did justice depart from the good angel? The teacher responds, if you want to speak properly, justice did not part, depart from the angel. Rather, the angel abandoned justice by willing what he ought not to will. So again, it was the angel choosing it. It was not justice that poofed and went away. Okay, why did he abandon justice? Uh, the teacher says, in, in saying that he abandoned it by willing what he ought not, I indicate clearly both why and how he abandoned it. He abandoned justice because he willed what he ought not to will, and he abandoned it by willing what he ought not to will. In other words, it was, it was the choice, because he made the choice. It was the choice. That's it. It was the choice. He made the choice. Then the student asks again, why did he will, to, why did he will what he ought not? The teacher says, no cause preceded this will except that he was able to will. So the ability to will was why he willed. But wait, the student says, wait, did he will it because he was able to will it? So was that the cause of it? And then the teacher, of course, responds, no. Because the good angel was likewise able to will it, was able to abandon justice, abandon rectitude. But he didn't. No one wills 
what he can will simply because he can with no other cause. Although no one ever wills anything unless he can will it. So it's a precondition, right? The capacity is a precondition, but it's not a determinant cause. Because it could go the other way. The student asks, then why did he will it? And the teacher, of course, responds, ultimately, simply because he willed it. I would stop asking the stupid question. Um, for there was no other cause by which his will was in any way incited or attracted. Instead, this will was its own efficient cause, if I may put the matter that way, and its own effect. So, thinking back to Aquinas again, the will and the will's choice is an, bless you, is an initiator of a new causal sequence. It is something like an unmoved mover. I say something like because it is created. It doesn't exist through its own right. It came into being. It'll pass out of being. And it is contingent and all of that. But the actual motion of the will is caused simply by the will. That's it. It is a self-cause. Now, how does this work? Well, part of this, and I'm drawing on uh, a later philosopher, Duns Scotus, who comments on this extensively, um, talks about a technical term, superabundant sufficiency. What this basically means is we have the capability of choosing A, and we have the capability of choosing B, and we have the capability of choosing not A, and we have the capability of choosing not B. The causal factors that lead to our choice are are fully explanatory of whatever choice we might make. Take for example, I made coffee this morning. Um, this coffee in particular is, uh, is, wait. Okay, yes, I was just confirming. This is a pecan praline coffee. It's a, it's a Winn-Dixie brand, it's actually pretty good, I recommend it. But I chose to make this particular flavored coffee instead of something else, instead of a different kind of coffee. Right? I have a couple of other, other grinds and roasts. I have uh, a couple of flavors and things I could put in here, but I chose this one. Why? Because it's a nice autumn morning. This is very fitting with it. It's nice and soothing on the last bits of my sinusy problems from Tuesday, right? All kinds of stuff like that, right? This, is, this was a, a good choice that I made for certain reasons. However, I could have chosen, say, the French roast that was sitting right next to it for equally good reasons. Because it's a darker roast, it is particularly suited to a, to a cold, humid morning. Uh, because it is uh, more caffeinated, so I'll have more energy for the day. Um, because maybe this morning I might have felt like French roast instead of pecan praline. My choice would have been equally comprehensible if I had made the other choice. So, if all of the causal factors involved uh, can fully explain this choice and the alternative, what could possibly explain me choosing this one over the alternative? Me. I do. That's it. It's my choice. I chose this one. It makes sense. There are reasons for choosing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and so just like the, the, the devil's choice between, between justice and advantage, it made perfect sense for the devil to choose advantage from his own internal perspective because he had an inclination for advantage over justice. Similarly, it makes perfect sense for the unfallen angels to have chosen justice over advantage because they had an inclination for justice. They had, they, both of them had exactly the same inclinations, all of the same wills, all of the same circumstances, everything was absolutely identical. Some of them made one choice, some of them made the other, because they made the choice. That's it. Discuss. And now, it makes perfect sense that they made the choice that they made, but it also would have made perfect sense for them to make the opposite choice. And that's it. If they wanted to. And that's it.